A brief account then of the revival in Campbell's Lang in the year 1742. Campbell's Lang is just five miles southeast of Glasgow. It's on the River Clyde, a beautiful country area with fine hills. The population at that date in Campbell's Lang was less than a thousand. The minister was the Reverend William McCulloch. His church was a congregation of the Church of Scotland, and he came to that charge, to that pulpit in 1731, at the age of 40. He was in this one parish, this one church, all his life. In his parish, 11 years before, I'm sorry, he was in his parish 11 years before revival broke out. So he was 11 years struggling with church problems of various kinds. McCulloch came from southwest Scotland, where there had been great blessing in the 17th century. That was the covenanting era, and uh, many outstanding leaders of the covenants came from southwest Scotland. That was his background. Now, he was a clever man academically. He was good at mathematics, good at languages, and especially good at Hebrew. And anyone who's tried learning Hebrew knows what a difficult language it is. So he really had a very good brain. But he was not an impressive speaker. He was not an impressive preacher, though a very devout, serious, and sound Christian. He was very godly, but he was not eloquent. But God used him mightily in revival. And the lesson surely is, them that honor me, I will honor. Revival comes not by might nor by power, but by the right hand of God. A little of the background history. The churches in Scotland were very spiritual in the 17th century up to the year 1860, sorry, 188, I'll correct myself, 1688, excuse me. 1688, that was called a revolution settlement. Before that, ministers were deeply sound, reformed, principles of worship, principles of doctrine, catechism. The people were well taught by the ministers of that up to that date. But after 1688, a whole lot of other types of ministers came in who weren't even evangelical. Let me quote from Gilbert Burnett, Bishop of Salisbury, right here. He said this, <clears throat> After 1688, ministers now generally are very mean and despicable in all respects. They are the worst preachers I have ever heard. Many of them are openly vicious. I suppose he means guilty of bad behavior. <clears throat> they are a disgrace to their orders in the ministry. So now that's the kind of thing which was happening. So from being a time of blessing in the covenanting days, after 1688 and 9, a new generation of preachers was flooding into the Church of Scotland. An eminent leader in Scotland was James Hogg of Carnock. This is what James Hogg had to say about these new men. We came to be crowded with a set of new Presbyterians who had gone all the length of compliance, meaning compromise, in the recent times. They had compromised and compromised and compromised the truth. And now they were coming into the church wholesale. Society as a whole became more and more declined. Before 1688, the concern of people was for truth, for God, for salvation, for heaven, and spiritual things. Now, after 1688, 
people's minds turned to enjoyment of the world. <coughs> and error was tolerated. It was the dawn of an age of secularism. Another famous writer said this. <coughs> His name was Robert Woodrow, minister of Eastwood, writing in 1724. He said he was deeply concerned for the steep and rapid decline of the Church of Christ. Young students, he said, for the ministry, were poor. There was a new style of preaching coming in. Not the kind of evangelism we heard tonight. No, no, no. It was not theological, and it was not experimental. The concern of these young preachers was not power, but to be polished. In 1712 in Scotland, under Queen Anne, there came in an act which did an awful lot of harm. It was called the Patronage Act. This Patronage Act gave power to the local landowner to have a say in who would be the local minister in the congregation. He might not have been interested in religion, he might not have been in any sense a Christian, but this act gave local landowners and people of power like that the authority to have a big say in who was the local minister of the parish. And this act, called the Patronage Act, it troubled Scotland for over a hundred years. <laughs> now, in Campbell's Lang, let me say something about the preparatory work going on in the churches of Scotland as a whole. God, in this difficult situation of decline, raised up a highly spiritual man called Thomas Boston. He's the author of a very famous book you will know called The Fourfold State, the state of innocence, <clears throat> the state of sin, the state of redemption or salvation or grace, the state of glory. If you haven't read that book, I do recommend it. It's an excellent book. One day, as um, Thomas Boston was in his parish in Simprin, he was visiting various people in his congregation. And as he sat one day in the house of one of the people in his church, sitting in the house, he saw a shelf of books above the door. And one was a book called The Marrow of Modern Divinity. It was written by an English Puritan called Edward Fisher. And he took it off the shelf and it transformed his whole life. He saw things in a new way. <clears throat> this is the way he put it. It was a light which the Lord had seasonably struck up to me in my darkness. And it began a movement in Scotland known as the Marrow Theology Movement. What was that? Well, let me make clear to you why this movement was so influential. After the age of the Puritans and the Covenanters in Scotland, part of this religious decline meant that people in the pulpits were no longer telling sinners to repent and come to Christ, what we heard tonight. Instead, they were sort of making it complicated for sinners to come to Christ. They were making it clear, as we had tonight, all sorts of problems were being brought in, some of them pseudo-theological problems. But now the Marrow theology, which Thomas Boston came across in that little book, taught this, to teach people to come to Christ by believing that he will accept you, justify you, and save you freely by his grace. The teaching was, it is true humility to take Christ for what he offers you. Now, the Marrow emphasis then was to press the claims of Christ upon the consciences of all that heard the word of God. And having found Christ, it pressed upon the conscience to give Christ no rest until you had a full assurance of salvation. I always like what John Wesley said in this regard. Wesley wasn't theologically sound in all respects, certainly, but 
he had some very good points. And I love what he said when he got assurance that day, remember? My heart was strangely warmed. And that's what drove him all over the country, preaching the gospel. So this was the marrow emphasis. Get Christ, because he offers himself freely to you, and give God this earnest plea. O oh Lord, give me full salvation, so that I not only know Christ, but I know that I know Christ. That was the emphasis. So this Mallow emphasis began to come into Scotland in the pulpits of Scotland in the 1720s, and it affected this dear man, McCulloch, and he too shared this view. Now the parish had a number of problems. There were 10 or 11 very difficult years for him from 1731 to 42, when the revival came. First of all, his people were badly taught. They weren't getting the sort of preaching you get in this pulpit every week. They weren't being taught the catechism. There was no sacrament of the Lord's Supper for three years. McCulloch was rather depressed. In a conversation with another famous Christian man, he poured out his soul and he said, you know, I doubt really if I've been called to the work of the ministry. It's amazing, isn't it? A man so used of God, he doubted whether he'd ever had a true call to the ministry at that point in time. He had, since his ordination, been preaching on conversion. Now, he doubted if he himself was converted. My dear friends, you should realize that a minister's under a lot of emotional strain. Always do everything in your power to encourage a faithful minister. Always do everything in your power to encourage a true, good and godly and faithful minister. It's easy to put a load of problems in front of him. He's got enough troubles without that. The devil sees he'll have plenty of problems. And this is what McCulloch had. Plenty of these problems. More than that, a division occurred in his congregation among the elders. And this reached the crisis in 1739. Some elders left him to go to what we call a secession church. The secession church was a different denomination. I won't bother you with the details of why they seceded, but um, they did. <coughs> Ebenezer and Ralph Erskine and others, they moved away over the patronage, the patronage Act. They wanted nothing to do with the Patronage Act. So... They had a new denomination, small denomination, and some of the elders with McCulloch left him to go into this new denomination. These were the difficulties, but now there were some encouragements. One of these was news coming from New Jersey in America of a revival that was taking place in the year 1730, and this news now reads Scotland. In 1734, a revival occurred in Northampton, Massachusetts, under the great Jonathan Edwards in New England. We can't speak too highly of Jonathan Edwards. He was an outstanding theologian, an outstanding man of God, a man of profound influence for good. Dr. Lloyd-Jones was deeply influenced by Jonathan Edwards. You may know the interesting story. He was once... I think it was in or near London, looking for good theological books, and he went into a second-hand bookshop with theological books in it, and he saw his two books on the ground floor, and he had to go on his knees to get them. And he always said that. He had to go on his knees to get these two volumes of Edwards, which had a profound influence upon him. He had to go on his knees to get them, significantly, he said. And then, in addition to the American revival, in South Wales, a revival began in 1735 under Daniel Rowland, and Howell Harris. So here and there, both in Scotland and England, there were groups of Christians now gathering for prayer. May I be forgiven for emphasizing this? Isn't this a message for us? Here and there in Scotland and England, groups were gathering for prayer. Maybe just two or three, maybe six or seven, maybe half a dozen. And they were crying out to high heaven to send the Spirit down. You know, we could do with more of those prayer groups in our country today, couldn't we? 
Now I come to the spark, as we call it, the spark which ignited the fire. The 31st of January, 1742, McCulloch preached on the subject, the abundance of divine consolation. This is what he said as he saw his people. He said, I see marks of more concern for salvation than in times past. He urged them not to stifle these convictions which they felt. Then the congregation requested a weekly lecture. They wanted more doctrine. The first two lectures produced nothing unusual, but there was a thirst for the word of God began amongst the congregation. On the Sabbath, February the 14th, 1742, the kirk, as we call it in Scotland, the church, was full. Many were having to stand for want of seats. And he preached on the new birth. You must be born again. And then came the spark. Let me give you this spark to the revival. A woman named Catherine Jackson became deeply distressed <coughs> And with her two sisters, she was taken to the church's manse. Manse, you know, is the, where the minister lives. The manse is a church house. And in the manse, they tried to help her to find peace with God. She cried out three times, What shall I do? What shall I do? What shall I do? To get peace with God, you see. So they counseled her. And then she got assurance from God. And this is what she said. It's lovely. My beloved, meaning Christ, <clears throat> is the chief among 10,000. And when the people saw the transformation in a character from fear and dread and tears to assurance, they were amazed. And this affected many other people. So <clears throat> weeping began. Many of those in the house or the manse, they started to cry because of a sense of of the divinity of the truth of the gospel. And their crying could be heard a long way off. And then they began to sing Psalm 103, O oh, my soul, bless God the Lord. And this lasted for three hours, singing, praising God. The revival had now begun. <clears throat> Those who were at the prayer meeting, who heard the report of it, were greatly affected. And on Thursday, the 18th of February that year, 1742, McCulloch preached a sermon on Jeremiah 23, verse 6. And this is the name wherewith he shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. It had a profound effect on those that heard it. Just like a new gospel, said one. One young man wept through the sermon for the whole time. A young woman there had tears running down her face throughout the whole sermon. Mary Mitchell, another lady, said, My heart beat violently. McCulloch then cried out. These were McCulloch's words on this pulpit. Where are the fruits of my poor labors among this people? And then people went to the manse again to get more help. About 50 went to the manse. Psalm singing was conducted, as we had a moment ago, and then they were counseled. And about 15 souls got peace with God there and then in the house. These events became widely known, and people began now to flock to the church. You know, that's what happens. When people hear of excitement in the church, they come from all sides to find out what happened. The godly John Willison of Dundee, who was a great theologian, judged now that revival had begun, and he pressed the ministers to seek to rouse their churches throughout Scotland. He said, it's beginning there in Campbell's Lang. Cry to God that it'll come to your own places. Now, here in England, the great preacher George Whitfield heard of the revival in Campbell's Lang. And this is what he wrote. In Scotland, the awakening gets greater and greater. One evening at the Campbell's Lang church, there occurred an extraordinary awakening in which 30 people were converted. In less than three weeks, about 300 souls were awakened, and 200 of these hopefully were converted. Crowds are now coming to hear the preaching. Between nine and 10,000 people were gathering, obviously not in the church, but in the open air. No church could hold 10,000. Whitfield arrived in Scotland in June 1742, 
and he preached on the 6th of July three times, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, 6 o'clock, and 9 o'clock at night, three sermons. This is what the comment said. Such a commotion surely never was heard of, especially at 11 o'clock at night. It far outdid all that I ever saw. That's Whitfield speaking, and he saw plenty in America. He said the people were like people in a battlefield. They were struck down by the power of conviction, crying out to God for mercy. And all night, people were in the fields, praying and crying out to God. Well, the revival was now at its height. This was 1742, and there were two communion seasons held that year. Whitfield preached at them both. <clears throat> at the first communion, he preached to something like 30 to 50,000. And in the second, more still. And this is what Whitfield said. May our exalted Redeemer go from, still go on from continue conquering to conquer until the whole earth be filled with his glory. Now I'll take one minute further and I shall talk about James Robe, whom I've not yet mentioned. James Robe was a faithful minister in a nearby parish of Kilsyth, very close by. Revival broke out in his parish in April 1742, and Robe wrote a careful narrative of the revival dated 1742. His claim that the revival is a genuine work of God was challenged by an associate presbytery minister called James Fisher. He said, this thing you call revival, he said, it's delusion. It's fantasy fanaticism. You see, he was skeptical about the reality and genuineness of it. So the great contribution which Roe put in to the Campbell's Lang revival was this. He wrote a defense of the genuineness and spiritual character of the revival. He began this narrative in November of 1743, and he started a magazine called The Christian Monthly History. It gave out revival news from Scotland and elsewhere, and Robe carried on an important correspondence with Jonathan Edwards in New England. Robe also started a concert of prayer, there it is again, encouraging people to pray for revival. And this was very significant, and it helped to start the rise of missionary outreach, which went to many parts of the world. So that then is a brief narrative of that revival. <laughs>